um, we're just going to spend the next 15 minutes or so uh, talking a little bit about research and um, kind of parlaying that also into academic production outside of research and also promotions uh, a little bit. And uh, feel free to interrupt at any point um, with any questions. And uh, obviously, everybody up here is a resource. So even later today, if you have questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Uh, I'm Sanjay Gupta, emergency medicine Sanjay Gupta. Uh, and uh, so I'm kind of wilderness background. Mainly, I'm an administrator. I'm usually in a suit now, and I'm a department lead. So uh, just uh, I'm just going to throw this out there as we talk, have conversations about professional burnout and resiliency. This is the stuff that prevents burnout. I'm going to put that out there right now. Get outside, do something you love, and find an academic niche. Um, if academia is your future, um, that is always going to sustain you. And uh, I got to tell you, wilderness medicine is, is definitely um, fits the bill in that regard. So kind of the, the purpose of this talk is to uh, just talk about some of the challenges and benefits of doing wilderness research. And we're going to talk about funding a little bit and publications. And a lot of this is based on examples of what established programs have out there. S Stuart has the benefit of having uh, one of the two first. He's kind of a founder in wilderness medicine in terms of uh, fellowships at his site. Stanford's another one, you know, kind of the early adopters. And you know, some of the examples are coming from these sites just because they have years and years and years of data available. So let's talk about some of the unique challenges of wilderness research. Stuart showed you some incredible slides. He's done some great high altitude research and research in really remote environments. And uh, um, so many of the folks at the table, but they can tell you there's a lot of challenges in order to, to actually kind of get these things accomplished. So just things to keep in mind as you're going in the future. So one is obviously research setting your wilderness stocks, you're willing to go anywhere and basically do anything in any location. Uh, but that could be a challenge in setting up a really proper uh, research study. And um, you know, there are challenges like IRB. Does the IRB at your home institution kind of cover your activity in uh, subject uh, recruitment in Nepal, let's say? So this is something that you're always going to have to hash out with your IRB and see what the scope of that IRB is. And if you're partnering with institutions in other countries as your kind of IRB participation cover their duty if you do multinational, multi-institutional. So a lot of uh, factors you may not have to face if you're doing bench research or research uh, that's uh, multi-centered, you know, in the U.S. Logistics. So Stuart's talking about a portable MRI. He's done a lot of uh, ultrasound research, um, as has uh, uh, many here, but it's kind of the challenge is uh, how do you get these machines up there? How do you keep them safe? How do you store your data in a secure fashion? You know, how do you do these things? So these are different logistics and you need There's a cost involved. There's a manpower issue involved. Uh, funding. Funding's a challenge anywhere, no matter what research you're doing. But the minute that you go, yeah, I'm going to do this wilderness medicine research project, it's the O. Oh, what is that, as Stuart just talked about, but also how do you parlay that into somebody just not thinking that you're going out into the woods or up a mountain or under the sea uh, to have fun primarily? And it can be a challenge as you kind of define that. Uh, manpower. There are a lot of enthusiastic people. You are those enthusiastic people, but you might be those only, the only enthusiastic people in this. So you always have to find a group of uh, how are you going to recruit folks who are going to help you recruit subjects, maintain data, uh, analyze data, all in a remote setting. And that could be challenging. So you might have to think about local assets in this, uh, partnering um, with organizations. The nice thing about wilderness medicine is it's a great network. People are usually pretty open and will uh, make connections for you. But you got to think about this might be you, might be you and one other person. So that's going to limit the scope of potentially of what you can do. If you are doing remote research, I mean, there's plenty of wilderness research you could do locally as well, if you think about what wilderness medicine is. Uh, environment, um, I think Hillary has a, a lot of prime examples of, you know, taking machines up to high altitude in cold temperatures and realizing that the batteries don't charge, right? Yeah, some challenges that if you're going to do ultrasound research, but 
you have no power for your ultrasound machines, that could be a problem. So it's things to consider with technology and environment. Are your um, products going to be durable in these environments? And then the impact, and I, I hate to bring this up, as we talk about really traditional academia and what the impact is, there are not very many journals in wilderness medicine. There are altitude journals, there are journals that kind of parlay and touch point. But what is the impact of your research? Let's say you go in, you recruit 50 subjects uh, somewhere in high altitude and you publish a great paper, but is that going to be impactful to the whole wide house of medicine? It may be, it may not be. My personal opinion is I don't really care because funding research is something that I'm interested in, that I hope my institution's in, interested in, and they're supporting me, so I'm just going to go and do it anyway. Uh, just kind of areas of interest in research in wilderness medicine. This is certainly not uh, comprehensive. This is adopted from EMRA's uh, kind of website um, in their wilderness club. So you could see that as we talk about wilderness, it's a very uh, ill-defined definition, meaning that wilderness can be basically anything you want it to be, and it has touch points in so many different areas. And it's evidence even today that there's going to be a half-day pre-conference in the afternoon on uh, uh, climate change and how that impacts human health. And that's, you know, obviously Renee Salas back there um, is, touches on this as well. Um, so topic areas for wilderness medicine research projects and funding, and this is adopted from the Wilderness Medical Society. So just, you know, the types of uh, projects that are of interest and can be funded. So as you can see, again, spans the gamut of, of research. You talk about surveys and basic science and clinical science and public health and injury prevention and pre-hospital care. So there's no, no real limit to what you can think about doing. And you know, what is the current state of research in, uh, in wilderness medicine? Obviously, we always have a big slant on, you know, there's altitude medicine is always big, and, but some of that is also um, basic science, some of that is clinical science, uh, but you know, as we're talking more and more about uh, uh, impact of climate change and on human health, so I think um, population health is becoming uh, very important. Uh, disaster, uh, disaster preparedness, so as the climate changes, um, extreme weather conditions are going to change, so this is going to have a huge impact on disasters. Uh, if you're an educator and you're interested in medical education, most education in wilderness medicine, if you've ever been on an elective, is kind of in situ, simulations-based care, but there is a science and an expertise that comes to this, so how do we actually up that game and bring that science more into the forefront of the education that's provided? So that's a whole wide open uh, opportunity there. And uh, extreme environments and human physiology. Okay, where's the next great untapped space that we're going to... Oh, I just gave it away. So, space. You're going to have people who are going to pay big money to go into space or dive deep, and they're going to be physicians who are needed uh, to medically clear people to say that, hey, these folks are okay, you could do this, and uh, kind of those um, activities are going to have to be evaluated. And trust me, there are people out there who are already medical directors for SpaceX and things like that. So this is, this is in the next decade or so. So as we talk about money, so all you students here, I want you to take a look. These are grants that are offered, not big money. These are small money kind of grants by the uh, Wilderness Medical Society. But it's uh, annual grants that are available to folks. So particularly for the medical students, the Houston grant often goes unfunded. So I want you all students go find a mentor at your medical school, in your emergency departments or wherever, and put together a proposal. It does not have to be the world's greatest proposal. Just trust me, just find an idea that you like and write it. But what happens is that there are not a lot of students that apply. Or the, um, the quality of the submissions are not that high, so the, the uh, grants go unfunded. So I would say if you are really interested, and what's really unique about these grants is that they will pay for travel which a lot of them do not, but these do. So this is your opportunity to obtain uh, five grand to go do a project in something that you like, find a mentor, uh, and do it, because otherwise this money just sits there unused. Um, 
and there are other members who are really involved in WMS who review these grants who can, who can attest to that. Uh, research and training grant is for residents or fellows. This is probably the most competitive area uh, to get a grant if you're a resident or a fellow uh, because also this accounts for like postdocs and things like that. So usually this is the highest uh, kind of concentration of grant proposals. Um, Hulk grant is a grant for WMS members. So if you're a member, this is open to you regardless of your status, whether you're a student, a faculty member, or a community doctor, or an academic doctor. It doesn't, doesn't really make a difference. A paramedic, it's open. And the Hackett Auerbach grant um, is more of a career development grant. So if wilderness, high altitude, dive physiology, um, environmental uh, work is what you're going to do and you're basically within five years of your career starting um, this is kind of the, the grant for you and you know it gets a, f a fair number of grants but uh, definitely on the competitive scale uh, this is something for the students and the residents in here if this is something you're going to do which is, is going to be appropriate for you and then there's the adventure travel research grant um, this is a grant that's been, uh, money's been allocated that if you do one of the CME programs with WMS, um, you may be able to get a grant to conduct some research while you're on one of those programs. Um, I don't think this has been funded at all. Do you know? I haven't been on a trip where it has been. It's okay. Okay. Yeah, so it went for a few years unfunded, so it sounds like it might be uh, being sunsetted. So, but there's funding from other sources too, and you guys should really look, uh, depending on where you are. You know, a lot of medical schools have grants for student researchers, and it's uh, sometimes something you just have to dig into and look into. But uh, one thing about a wilderness grant is that it's so unique in that if you go, look, I want to do this uh, research, you know, X, Y, and Z, and let's looking at uh, freshwater cleanliness and the high peaks or something like that, you know, most med students aren't going to do stuff like that. So it's something to look into. So we talked about the Wilderness Medical Society. There are other private or nonprofit organizations that do provide grants, like Racing the Planet, the Alpine, uh, the American Alpine Club, Divers Alert Network. So just have to look around. Uh, Stewart's uh, been very successful getting funding uh, in conjunction with the DOD. Uh, those are areas, DARPA. A National Science Foundation, but local funding, I think, is an area where um, you know people should should look, particularly in their medical schools. There are usually grants around that might be available, or even it sounds stupid in the hospital. I mean, if you have a medical staff society, sometimes their uh, their money's allocated for for research or for um, things like that. So we just look around. So types of public uh, published research, and this is the Stanford experience. It's just uh, an example of the breadth of research that uh, goes around. So if you look, there's ultrasound, there's injury prevention, um, there's clinical science in terms of medication usage. So whatever your interest is, you can um, certainly turn it into a project. So kind of future directions, there's always an agenda for what is, uh, this is constant improvements, right? What's the agenda for research in emergency medicine slash wilderness medicine? Is there something cohesive? Are there niche areas that we really should be focusing on in the near future? Um, should kind of all these disparate groups and areas, you saw that map of all the fellowships that are around, should all those departments actually be working together in multi-site collaborations um, to increase numbers and impact? You know, maybe it's a thought. Uh, we have to think about landing zones. Like I said, there are not that many journals in emergency medicine slash wilderness medicine that are available for publication. So is there a need for, uh, to increase this? And the opportunities are pretty wide now. I mean, with journals being uh, not so much based in societies or on paper anymore, is there opportunity to start a new journal that's completely online based and uh, that's PMID indexed? You know, I think that's a, that's definitely a possibility for people who are interested uh, to do and kind of pursue. I think uh, looking for new sources of funding is important. Uh, future directions, I had a friend who tried this last year, um, crowdfunding research. So just uh, uh, tried it, didn't work out. He was trying to crowdfund a project about uh, beer as a recovery drink for extreme racing, which I 
fully endorse. Uh, he wanted fifteen hundred bucks. I gave him a hundred. I think he in total got one hundred and fifty dollars for his project. So uh, he he refunded my money back. But uh, <laughs> but uh, it's it's a new opportunity that if we can crowdfund ideas, I go to crowdfund money for research for something that might be impactful or, or um, interest of interest to people. So other opportunities, and I'm going to just kind of go through this really quickly, is that we have to think about, even outside of research, research is not necessarily key. Certain medical schools have different pathways for academic promotions, and a lot of these are not based in uh, straight clinical research anymore. That's really an old model. So uh, there are a lot of writing opportunities out there, particularly in a field that's so unique and that doesn't really have a ton of data. So clinical guidelines or consensus statements, case series are always interesting particularly in remote areas and experiences. EMS is always looking for um, uh, writers to help with kind of remote uh, EMS protocols, uh, book chapters, books. Stuart and Tracy were editors-in-chief of uh, Auerbach's uh, Wilderness Medicine. So there's a ton out there. And also, I hate to say it now, uh, medical reporting, as much as you don't necessarily have to be in front, but your opportunity to to start a YouTube channel, that sounds very silly, or to even just write for an online medical magazine, they always need correspondence. So this is non-peer-reviewed stuff, but you can always find opportunities to write if you really um, look for them. And teaching opportunities, I think this is where the, the money is. I mean, wilderness medicine educators are unique in that they teach anywhere in any environment. So if it's raining or snowing, if it's cold, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I'm still going to do it. Uh, so the thing is, once you put yourself out there as you're really enthusiastic and you want to teach, trust me, you will get invitations to teach. I would all suggest for all of you who want to teach, just talk to that man right there in the burgundy shirt, and he will invite you to camp out down south somewhere at a student conference, but that attracts hundreds of medical students and other students every year. As, as faculty. And then, you know, it really par parlays into being uh, course directors as well as you think is, once you gain enough experience, you do that. And this is important. If you look at promotions and you really have to look at the criteria for your medical school, usually as you are trying to go from assistant to associate or associate to full, what you really have to define yourself as an expert in that clinical area. And doing things like becoming a faculty member, being a course director, is that definition if you're going to pursue avenues outside of there. I mean, in truth, even my, my personal experience, I got promoted to associate professor recently. I'm a department director. I'm in a suit most of the time and in, in meetings and this or that. But the reason I got promoted on kind of a, um, a clinical pathway is because of wilderness medicine. So I'm the only wilderness doctor at uh, Zucker School of Medicine, and actually the head of the promotions committee even came up to me afterwards. He goes, yeah, we got your CV. None of us knew what wilderness medicine was. You look like an expert. So we said, hey, what the hell, We're from, we'll promote this guy. So at the School of Medicine, I am the wilderness guy. So I have the, you know, the deans writing me and the medical students to come do the stuff that I don't have time to do. But um, that's, that's an aside. So uh, student education, there are a bunch of people here, particularly from Jefferson and uh, other locations who've made a career out of teaching students. And there's a really high value with the medical schools uh, for this. And it's a big draw. Uh, it's attractive to students. It, it highlights the school. It highlights your department. So. Um, it's, uh, it's really kind of interesting to do and to become a part of. And like I said, all this kind of rolls up into you being an expert, right? If you have on your CV that you've been invited faculty 25 times, you're an expert in this field. And I'm over time, so I'm going to take one more second. And uh, that's it. So other areas, and you young people, we don't do this. We're old. You give me PowerPoint. I feel much more comfortable. But there is no limit to, to how you define your expertise. And in fact, there's some medical schools now that will accept uh, non-traditional writing as means for academic promotion. So even kind of the blogosphere and um, podcasting and this stuff is of value because there's traffic, right? There are clicks. Um, all this is of value. So uh, you really have to look at your department and your school and seeing what's of value. But that's something you can certainly develop in a much better way than um, uh, many other generations can. So again. There's a future for all this. But again, promotions, know what your school wants, and 
and tailor, tailor your like wilderness medicine journey to match. But remember, you are so unique in this. You're going to be the only wilderness person, or one or two. And if you define yourself as that, and um, kind of pursue that in a really expert way, I mean, you are this unique faculty at any school or any department. Okay, thank you.